Uh, but we're still in our Tackling Tough Questions series that we've been doing over the course of the summer. We've covered a bunch of uh, questions um, this uh, summer from is it a sin to be uh, gay to um, questions about um, what happens to the, the, those that never hear? What if they die and never hear uh, the gospel or hear about Jesus? We've looked at um, judging others. Should Christians judge other people? We've looked at several different things. And right now we're in a, uh, a little question uh, that this is the second part. And, and uh, originally when I set out to do this, um, the plan was to finish it this week, but as I got into it this week, I just realized that um, there was just too much in this topic. When you do topical messages like this, sometimes you realize there's a lot uh, more in there than just preaching one passage of Scripture that I normally do. Once once the fall kicks off, I'll go back to, to doing that again. So um, as I got into the study this week, I realized that, the, that, that two wasn't going to do it, and so next week we'll finish this up. Um, I say that to say, anytime I ever say my plan is to this or that, you should just hold that lightly. It may or may not happen that way. It, ju it just depends on what the course of my study looks like. But, but this is now going to be, instead of the final part, the second message of three on this question, how do we truly forgive someone who has wronged us? How do we truly forgive someone who's wronged us. And if you weren't here last week, which I'm sure several folks weren't here last week, we started by looking at two things. We looked at the basis of forgiveness, of our forgiveness of others, and we looked at the model of forgiveness that, that we're to follow. So with the basis of forgiveness, uh, we looked at the story of the unforgiving servant. And I won't rehash the story, but the lesson that we took from that is that if God forgave us such an impossible debt, that was the debt of that servant. It was a, a debt that he could never uh, work hard enough and long enough to repay 200,000 years worth of labor in order to pay back the debt that he owed this king. If God could forgive us such an impossible debt, then how could we withhold forgiveness towards other people? And so that helps answer the question um, why we must forgive, right? So, and, and it uh, answers the objection why I don't want to forgive, you might not want to forgive, but God has, has commanded us, and that story illustrates that, that we ought to be forgivers. And so the basis of the forgiveness that we give to other people then, we saw, is the forgiveness that we've received from God in Jesus. Then we looked at the model of our forgiveness, and we went to Ephesians chapter 4, 32, um, among other places, which says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And that shows us that, that God's forgiveness of us is not just the basis of our forgiveness. It doesn't just answer the why, but it's also the model of our forgiveness of other people. That, that we forgive others in the way that God forgave us. Say, so how, how are we to forgive other people? Well, we look to God in the way that he forgives other people, and we see the model of the way that we're to forgive other people. And so if we want to know how to forgive, we look to him. And so here are the five characteristics of God's forgiveness towards us that we looked at last week, and I'll do them with mostly no comment. Number one, God's forgiveness is gracious but not free, we said. Um, it, it's free to us, but it wasn't free to him. It was very costly, right? What did it cost God? It cost God the life of his son. So it's gracious, but not free. Number two, God's forgiveness is conditional, not unconditional. If God's forgiveness were unconditional, then everyone would receive it, but there is condition. And we said the condition of forgiveness that we see modeled in the scriptures is that it is upon repentance back towards God. So, so God's forgiveness is conditional, not unconditional. Number three, God's uh, forgiveness is a commitment, not a feeling. Why does God forgive us? It's not because he feels like forgiving us, but because he is committed to forgiving us. And God is always going to be faithful to do what he said he's going to do. Number four, God's forgiveness lays the groundwork for reconciliation and restoration. I'm going to come back to that in just a couple of minutes. Uh, and then number five, God's forgiveness does not eliminate all the consequences. Just because we're free from God's judgment and punishment, that does not mean we're free from all consequences. There are consequences to sin. With God, it's that we fall under the discipline of God. There are consequences in personal relationships among us, too. So just because you forgive does not mean all consequences are, are eliminated. So then, knowing then the basis of our forgiveness and the model of our forgiveness, now we're ready to build 
biblically define forgiveness. It's important to do this, again, so that we don't let culture define it, so we don't let our opinions or our wants define it. We want to let God define what biblical forgiveness looks like. And this is the definition from the book that I mentioned last week, which again, I would encourage you if you, are, if you are battling deeply with forgiving someone right now, I would greatly encourage you to pick up that book. It's called Unpacking Forgiveness by a guy named Chris Braun. And the definition that he goes with, which I really like, is forgiveness is a commitment by the offended to pardon graciously the repentant from moral liability and to be reconciled to that person although not all consequences are necessarily eliminated. Now, that's a mouthful. I, I want to leave it up for, for just a minute if you take notes, but, but that's a good definition because, it's a good nef- definition because it incorporates all of those elements that we saw in God's forgiveness towards us into that, that definition of the way that we forgive. And so what that does then is it makes it a full and complete view of forgiveness rather than, we want that, we want the full complete view of forgiveness rather than or as an opposition to that limited and incomplete view of forgiveness that now dominates culture that we called last week therapeutic forgiveness. That, that was the term that defined or captured the, the model of forgiveness that is dominant right now in our culture, therapeutic forgiveness. And I mentioned this idea of therapeutic forgiveness is that forgiveness is all about you. It's all about the one that was wronged, the one who was sinned against, the one who was offended. And the idea behind it is that, that, that forgiveness is your path to healing, It's your path to being healed from the anger and the hurt that you're carrying inside you. It's your path to to being released from that bitterness that is poisoning your mind and your heart so that you can go on and live your life. And and the thing about it is, is it doesn't require anything from anyone except you. It doesn't even require that the person that hurt you know that you forgive them. You could tell them if you want to, but you don't have to. It doesn't require real repentance. It doesn't require real reconciliation. It's just forgiveness. This is a way to think about it. It's just forgiveness as personal therapy. And, and, and one website that I was on this week, it was sort of a psychology website, and put it like this. It said, forgiveness is not a selfless act that is in the sole benefit for the person that has wronged you. And I would agree with, with that to some degree in the sense of not the sole benefit It's not solely about them, but real forgiveness includes that. But they say it's not solely for the benefit of the person that's wronged you. Instead, listen to this, it is about, this is telling you what they think forgiveness is about, okay? It is about self-healing, empowerment, and liberation. You boil that all down, and, and, and it's all about self. It's all about you. It's all about the offended. Forgiveness, it it makes forgiveness personal only and and private maybe. Now there's a great chance that, that this view of forgiveness that's so pervasive in our culture, there is a great chance that that's the view of forgiveness that you've been living with. That's why I'm spending, this is now the second week I'm talking about it, because there's a really good chance that's the view that you've been taking of forgiveness. It's pervasive even in the church. And so Christians, we're, we're, we're taught rightly from the word that, that we're to forgive, that we're commanded to forgive, so that when that is our view of forgiveness, we're commanded to forgive, when someone hurts you or wrongs you in a deep way, we jump all over ourselves to proclaim, I forgive, I forgive. And it doesn't matter if the offender cares. It doesn't matter if he even admits to the wrong that he committed. It doesn't matter if he feels convicted. It doesn't matter if he feels guilty for it. It doesn't matter if he's repentant. It doesn't matter if the whole while he's laughing at you as you're talking about the hurt that, that, that he brought into your life or she brought into your life. None of that matters. It just We just forgive. And so if you believe that that is what forgiveness is, then what it means is that you are putting all of the weight on the offended Do you see that? All of the weight lands on on the victim of the wrong. 
Now I've been wronged, I've been hurt, I've been harmed, I've been sinned against, and it is all my responsibility as the offended, as the victim. It's all my responsibility to deal with it. And in doing that, again, I'm not trying to take God out of that equation. You can put God into that faulty view of forgiveness if you want to and say, no, it's about God and me or whatever. But, but it's still a redefinition because what it does is when you take that view, it makes light of sin. It makes light of justice. It makes light of personal responsibility. It makes light of repentance. It makes light of confession because ultimately in this view, none of those things matter. All that matters is you are on the path to healing. That's it. So what's the problem with that? What's, what's the problem with that view? That sounds nice. It sounds good. It sounds vaguely Christian. Right? If we hang on to those hurts, if we hang on to that sin, if we dwell on those things, then yes, bitterness can take root and it can begin to poison us from the inside out. If we hold on to those things, it can lead to deep anger. That, uh, it, it can lead to, to bouts of depression. And of course, those are bad things. So isn't it good to take those steps of healing so that you can get through your bitterness and live your life? Isn't it good to take those steps of healing so that you can let go of that anger and that hurt that is, that is infecting your life, of course it is good to take those steps. So does forgiveness help you with that? Yes, of course it can help with that. But the problem with this is not what it wants to do in your life. The problem with this view, apart from it not being the biblical view, but the problem with this view is, is that that's all it wants to do. It's, that it's all it wants to do. It's all about what happens in your life. See, what it does is it reduces forgiveness to this, this one-sided method of dealing with the hurt and the other consequences that come from being sinned against. But forgiveness is not just about dealing with the personal consequences. Forgiveness is about the relationship. I'll say again what I said last week. Forgiveness is relational. Get that idea in your head. Forgiveness is relational. It always involves not just one party, but it always involves two or more parties. It is relational. See, the ultimate goal of forgiveness is not your personal healing uh, from anger or from bitterness or from hurt or from whatever. That's not the ultimate goal. We want those things, but that's not the ultimate goal. See, I'm going to make a statement that, that I want you to, I hope that you will accept, and I'll show you at the end of the, the message kind of where I get this from, but, but, but you can put bitterness away without forgiving, okay? Those two things don't have to go together. You can put bitterness away without forgiving. So the goal of forgiveness is not that personal healing in your life. The goal of forgiveness ultimately is reconciliation and, if possible, restoration of the relationship, right? That, that's, that's it. That's the ultimate goal. It's reconciliation and hopefully restoration of that relationship. And I want to remind you again of what those things mean because this is important to get this in your mind. Reconciliation means ending the hostility that sin put between us. When we talk about us and God, there is hostility that is created between us and God because of sin, and that same thing is true in our personal relationships. Sin creates enemies out of people. It puts hostility between people. It puts a Bible term for it, enmity between other people. And so reconciliation means ending that hostility and that enmity between people that sin put in between us. And that's it at a minimum. When forgiveness happens at a minimum, we want, to, we want to see reconciliation take place. We want to see that hostility and enmity ended. When God forgives us in Christ, we become, the Bible says, reconciled to God. That means we no longer are at enmity with God. We are no longer at war with God anymore. We're now at peace. And that means then that God treats us in a different way. It means he does not count that sin against us anymore. He chooses it, to use biblical language, to toss it into that sea of forgetfulness and not hold it over our heads anymore. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Verse 19, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, 
not counting their trespasses against them. And it is the same thing when we forgive other people. One way to know, if you look at, um, have I really been able to forgive this other person? One way to know whether or not you've truly forgiven someone is that you stop holding it over that person's head. You, you stop counting it against them, right? Again, we're not talking about restoration yet. We're talking about reconciliation. I no longer hold this as something between us anymore. I choose to leave that behind. Is there something you need to choose to leave behind right now? Have you made a statement of forgiveness to someone, and yet you're still holding it over their heads? That happens, right? Pretty sure it's probably happened in all of our lives. We give lip service to forgiveness, but we don't let it go. We continue to hold it over that person's head and bring it up again and again. Now, we do what love requires in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where it says that love keeps no record of wrongs. That, that's, that's the reconciliation of forgiveness. And then restoration Restoration, again, this is different. Restoration is that that relationship gets restored to the place that it was before, or maybe, or hopefully even better than it was before. Now, realistically speaking, restoration between people may or may not happen. I mentioned that last week. It depends. That's part of the consequences of sin. There are times when true restoration is not going to happen, where we may look at someone, we may say, I forgive you. I no longer hold this against you anymore, but I cannot go back to the way it was before. I think I would put it like this. Restoration is not guaranteed. And if it happens, it usually takes longer than reconciliation does. You can be reconciled, before you're restored. You can be reconciled, but maybe not restored to the way that it was before. That's why it's worded the way that it is in that definition, in that point. It's worded that way for a reason, that forgiveness lays the groundwork for reconciliation and restoration. It doesn't necessarily happen, and it definitely doesn't automatically happen. A lot has to happen between people in order to restore that trust between them, and it may take some time to rebuild everything that was lost, everything that was destroyed, everything that was torn down. You can think about it real practically speaking. If you've ever had, a, for instance, a family member that was a drug addict, if anybody's had someone in their family that was a drug addict, you know what this looks like, that that, that, that person over the years will lie and steal and hurt the person that they say that they love very, very deeply. And when that happens, that relationship is deeply damaged. Trust is completely uh, just destroyed in that sense. So that even if I can forgive them, there are many things that need to happen happen before that relationship gets restored again, right? You have to be careful on the restoration side of things. I can want the best for you. I cannot hold it against you anymore, but that may mean that there is a, a, a time and maybe for the rest of our lives, but hopefully not, where I do not trust you. I do not necessarily let you back in quite the way that you were before. There are consequences that are involved in the sin that happens in our life. Uh, just practically for me, uh, for example, if someone harmed or hurt my children, even if I can forgive that person, it would be very hard for me to, to let that person into our circle again. It would take a lot. If it ever happened, it would really take a lot for that to happen. That's a consequence, but that is the goal, right? Forgiveness lays the groundwork for those things lays the groundwork for reconciliation, coming to peace with each other, and then restoring that relationship. Now, I know I've spent a lot of time on this, but I think it's important, crucial, especially in a time with such great misunderstanding, I think it is crucial that you get that full biblical view of forgiveness before you move into how it happens. So now I want to shift into, that, 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 that's what it is, I want to shift into how it happens, and we'll do that the next two weeks. We'll finish this next Sunday. But what I want to talk about today is laying the groundwork for forgiveness. There is groundwork that needs to be done in your life for forgiveness. Another way of saying that is becoming ready to forgive. I need to be ready to forgive. And if I'm going to be ready to forgive, then there is groundwork that needs to happen in my life. And so I mentioned last week that there is a way to forgive. There is a path that's laid out 
for forgiveness. It's not impossible. It may seem impossible, but it's not impossible. There is a way to do it, but the way is not quick and easy. I'm sorry to say that. I wish it was. I wish I could tell you there's a magic bullet. I wish I could tell you there's just a a real quick, easy secret that will allow you to immediately and fully forgive someone, but it is not quick and easy. There is no shortcut to deep biblical forgiveness. It's a process. It's a process, and sometimes it is a long process. It can be a long one, and sometimes it's a hard process, and sometimes there's ups and downs to it. Have you found that to be true in your life? Have you found it to be true that the process of forgiveness can be long? doesn't always. It can be hard. doesn't always. There can be ups and downs. How many of you have ever thought you forgave someone only to discover a year down the road that you really haven't. You thought you did, you really haven't. It takes one, one memory, one instance to trigger that hurt again, to trigger that anger towards that person again. One instance to trigger you to realize, okay, maybe I haven't as fully forgiven as I, as I thought that I had. It's a process that that comes with those ups and downs. And that is the nature, by the way, of everything in the Christian life. Why? Because that is the nature of sanctification. The nature of sanctification is that it is a process. It is a long process. Sometimes it is a hard process and is a process that comes with ups and downs. Is that not true about our sanctification, our growth in Christ-likeness and Christian maturity? There is much up and down about it. And, And that's really what we're talking about. I want you to hear this. The only way to grow in biblical forgiveness is to grow in Christ likeness. That's it. So how, how do I grow in forgiveness? I have to grow in Christ's likeness. That's why I started last week talking about God's character and God's nature. Remember this if you were here last week. Why does God forgive? Why does God forgive? Well, he forgives because he's a forgiving God. It's not just something he does. It's who he is. Why does God show compassion? He shows compassion because he's a compassionate God. It's not just something he does, it's part of who he is. And so nothing that God does, does he do because it is the right thing to do. Do you realize that? Nothing God does, he does because it's the right thing to do. That's how we look at things. We ought to do it because it's the right thing to do. But, but to say God does something because it's the right thing to do is to say that there is some outside external standard of good that is separate from who God is. Does that make sense? To say that God does things because they're good is to say that there is some external standard that is separate from who God is that God follows. And that's the wrong way to to look at it. God does nothing to conform to any external standard of good or anything else. He's not conforming to anything. He is the standard. He's the standard. He simply conforms to himself. God is good. God is love. God is compassion. All of those things are what they are because God is who he is. He defines them. He fills in what those things are. How do we know what good is? We look at God. How do we know what love is? We look at God. How do we know what compassion is? We look at God. How do we know what forgiveness is? We look at God. He is the standard. He is the definition. And I know that sounds philosophical, but I think it is very important for you to understand that because what God is trying to do in your life, and I want you to listen closely. For some of you, this is just a reminder. For some of you, this may be new. What God is trying to do in your life is not get you to do the right thing things. He's not just trying to get you to follow all the rules. That's not what the Christian life is about. It is not about, hear me on this, it is not about transforming your behavior. 
That is not the starting place for God. And this is a hard thing to get out of our heads. That, that I can do all the, the right things most of the time and still be far from God. Do you realize that? Do you realize you can do all the right things most of the time but be far from God? I can give. I mean, I could give everything I have, but I can do it through gritted teeth. Have you ever given through gritted teeth? Have you ever given, maybe it's to church, maybe it's to whatever it might be, but have you ever written that tithe check out or that offering check out or whatever it is? You write it out, you put it in the plate, but you're gritting your teeth the whole time because you know what you're missing out on. Like, I know what I could buy with that. What if I didn't have to give this tithe every month? What if I didn't have to give this, see, that's, that's the wrong language. What if I didn't have to do this? I could buy that boat. I could buy a better car. I could take a better vacation. I could do this. I could do that. I could pay, all, you know, all those things. Oh, boy, if I did this, then I could do that. Okay, so, so the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, God loves a cheerful giver. So that tells me that there is a heart attitude behind my giving that the Lord actually loves. He loves the heart behind the giving. He doesn't love the gift. He loves the heart behind the giving. Now, that is just one example I could have picked from many things, but it applies to anything in the Christian life. It applies to even forgiveness. So I want you to hear this because this is the key really to the whole message today. God is not trying to get you to forgive, all right? God is not trying to get you to forgive. Listen, he's trying to get you to become the kind of person who forgives so that you forgive, do you see the difference there? That applies in everything. God's not trying to get you to forgive. He's trying to get you to become the kind of person who forgives. So let me ask you this question, and it's not a trick question. What kind of person forgives the way God forgives? I know nobody's going to shout the answer out anyway, so I'm going to answer it for you. But what kind of person forgives the way that God forgives? Again, not a trick question. Let's just go very basic here. The kind of person who forgives the way God forgives is someone who is like God. There you go. Who forgives the way God forgives? Someone who is like God. Now, if you hear that and you go, okay, um, that's really an impossible standard. None of us is like God. What I'm going to tell you is, you are absolutely right. None of us is like God. But guess what? That is what we're becoming. We're not there, but that's what we're becoming. It's not what I am right now. It is what I will be one day. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, listen to this, to be conformed to the image of his son. What is he working your life towards? To be conformed to the image of his son. Later on, chapter 12, verse 2, he said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. What is God doing? He's transforming you so that you look less like the world, more like the image of Jesus Christ. How? Through the renewal of your mind. That's going to come back again. Colossians 1, verse 28. Him we proclaim. Jesus we proclaim. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That word mature is the same word that we would use for, for end or purpose, the teleos of things, so that, that God's end game for you is that you would be conformed to the image of the perfect man. That is all the work God is trying to do in you. Not just get you to behave, get you to be a good person, get you to mind your manners, get you to be whatever, you know, do, do right and not do wrong. It, it's not just about that. It's that, that we would be conformed into the image of Christ, therefore our character would drive us in the direction of doing the things that God would do. And that affects 
not just what I do, but it affects the underlying motivations behind it. And I understand, let me just stop for a second. I understand this is very teachy, okay? I get that today, but it's necessary. It's got to be, I'll preach again one day, okay? So, but for today, this is more teachy than anything. So I know it's a lot of stuff, but I want you to just stay with me all throughout the rest of the message here, okay? So this affects that God is conforming me into the image of his son, that that is ultimately what he's trying to do in my life, that affects even the underlying motivations for doing what I do. I'll give you one example. In Colossians 3, 9 and 10, Paul says this. He says, do not lie to one another. Why? Do not lie to one another. Why? Is that just about good behavior? Is that what he's saying here? Is it just a matter of good behavior? Hey, don't lie Why? Because lying is bad. Is that why I don't lie? I don't lie because lying is bad. No, look what he says. He says, it's seeing as you have put off the old self with his practices and have put on the new self, which is being, look at this, renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. I don't lie because I'm not who I used to be anymore. I don't lie because that's not me now. I am becoming someone better. I am being renewed in my new self. I'm being renewed in knowledge after the image of my creator. It's like God doesn't lie, and I'm becoming like him. Why do I not lie? Because I'm becoming like him. I'm putting that old self off and putting on my, my new self that's being renewed in the, after the image of, of, of his creator. Now, how does that happen? That last phrase there is very interesting in the Colossians passage. He says, he says it's being renewed in knowledge. What does that mean? I'm being renewed in knowledge. This is not just like book knowledge that my renewal happens as I open up a book and read about God. That, that isn't doing it for you. That's not transforming you. There are a, a lots of very theologically smart lost people out there. There are people that do not believe in Jesus, but they know many, if not most, if not more than what we know, right? It's not just book. It's not just intellectual. It's being renewed in experiential knowledge from my creator. I, I'm learning about God, not just in my intellect, but in my daily experience. As as I'm seeing him in the word for who he is, I'm seeing the one that I'm becoming. And as I see that, and as I model my life after what I see in the scriptures about who God is, then God is slowly, step by step, and day by day, renewing my spirit, transforming me into more and more into the image of him in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if you are not increasingly knowing God in that way, that that I'm seeing him for who he is, I'm spending time with him day by day. I'm turning my life towards the things he desires day by day. Then what I would say is you're not going to be the kind of person who forgives the way God forgives. Have you heard the phrase, to err is human, to forgive is divine? Do you know what verse that comes from? It's not in the Bible, by the way. It's a poem, so that was a trick question. It's not in there, but it's a very true statement. That that type of forgiveness, that type of forgiveness that we're talking about, it's not part of our old self. It's not part of the, 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 the flesh that you are born with. It's part of the new self that you received when you were born again. It's not your nature. It is not in human nature, fallen human nature. It's in restored and recovered human nature. But it's not in the nature that you were born with to forgive that way. And so if you are in your daily life, if you are attempting to draw from, so you can draw from both those things. You have two competing forces inside you. I've taught this a million times. It's in the Bible. There's two things competing inside you. There is your flesh, 
the part, part of you that we're born with, and then there is the Spirit of God living in you, the restored, the renewed you, and those two things are at war with one another to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You want to follow God? Well, here's your flesh saying, you're going to follow me instead, and you can choose to draw from either of those two things in, in your day-to-day life. I can draw from the new me, or I can draw from the old me. What are you drawing from right now? In regards to your forgiveness, where are you drawing from? Are you drawing drawing from your flesh? Are you drawing from the new you? If you draw from your old self in in trying to forgive people that have hurt you deeply, you're going to constantly come up short, constantly. Now, you need to draw from the the man that you are becoming, the, the you that is being renewed after the knowledge uh, or renewed in knowledge after the image of your creator. So, so how then does that happen? How, how do I begin to, to increasingly listen to, to this and not this? How do I begin to increasingly draw from this new me and, and not listen to this old me? So I'm going to close. I know this has been heavy, so I got some illustration for you as we close. So, so we did a garden this year. I think I've probably shared that already. There was good and bad in the garden. You know, we had a few things that did really well. Blackberries, they did pretty good. We, we, that was mine and Brooke's nightly date. We just, we'd go on a date. That's what it's come to at this stage. So we just, like, let's go outside in the yard. Let's take a date to the blackberry bush and just see what's black. And if we saw a black one, we'd grab it and eat it, and that was, that was fun. It was nice. So they did well. Many other things did okay. Other stuff didn't do too well. What did awful tomatoes? Terrible. I don't know if anybody else had trouble with tomatoes this year. Maybe I'm wrong about this. I don't know. I'm going to give you my conclusion about it, but, but it was the worst crop. We've done tomatoes many times in the past before. We've gotten good ones this year. I think we got three good tomatoes out of maybe like five plants. Is it five or six tomato plants? I think we had three good tomatoes. And one of those tomatoes um, was only good after we put it in a paper bag for a while and let it ripen. It was like, we, we're going to have to get this or it's just going to die and rot on the vine before it ever gets good. Um, and so, so it's the worst crop that we've ever had. And what I believe is, I believe that the reason why the crop of tomatoes was so terrible was because the soil was not good soil for producing tomatoes. That's it. I, I think that's the bottom line. I think the soil was such that it was not, how do you say this, not good for growing tomatoes. So what we should have did is some groundwork before we planted the tomatoes. And we did a little bit, but not enough. We should have done more groundwork. What we should have done, we should have spent more time at the beginning, and we're learning year by year, but we should have spent more time before we ever planted tomato plants. We should have spent the time cultivating that soil. Cultivating that soil. Make it the kind, listen to this, make it the kind of soil that produces good fruit. Does that sound familiar to you after this message? We should have cultivated the soil to make it the kind of soil that produces good fruit. Now, what would that be? That, that, that's all about putting in and taking out. It's putting in and taking out. It's putting in the right things. My soil is just some old clay. That's what it is. You may have better soil at your house. Mine isn't. It's just clay. You dig the grass up, and what's underneath? Clay. That's it. That's what we have to deal with. We should have put some things in there. That clay soil doesn't make good tomatoes. We should have put some topsoil on that thing. We should have put some, some nutrients in there. We should have put some compost. I don't know what you use, compost, mushroom compost, manure, whatever it is. We should have mixed that in, put a little bit of fertilizer in there, organic or otherwise, depending on your preference for your soil. We should have done that. We should have put all those things in, whatever. Take out then the wrong things. Put in the good things. Take out those, those bad things. Clear it of all the weeds. Clear it of all the grass. Cleared of all the things that are competing for the nutrients in the soil, however few nutrients there might have been in our soil. Whatever it is, it's taking those things out. And then we plant. After that, we plant. And after we plant, guess what? You still got to cultivate. I did the groundwork. I did the prep work. I'm trying to make it ready, but I don't give up then. I got to keep going. 
the whole time I plant it. Still got to tend to it. I still got to water it. I still got to, uh, to prune it. I've still got to especially get the watermelon thing off of it. My watermelon took over everything. That might be the problem. Weed it, prune it, water it, all those things so that it can get the nutrients that it needs. Man, if we, if we would have started there, we would have done that groundwork in full. We would have been eating tomato sandwiches all summer long instead of peanut butter sandwiches. It would have been beautiful. Could have had fresh BLT. That's a lot more work. Oh, but that's the only way to get the fruit. There's no other way to get it. It's a lot of work, but it's the only way to get the fruit. That's what I'm talking about. So how do I forgive? How do you forgive? I have to start by cultivating my heart. I'm doing the groundwork. What do we say that is? We said it's what you put in, what you take out. What you put in, what you take out. Let me start here. What are you putting in? You're cultivating the soil of your heart that you would be the type of person that forgives. What are you putting in there? What are the nutrients you're feeding your heart with? Are you putting in the word of God, that rich nutrient from his mouth to your heart? Are you filling it with those things? Are you filling it with with music that points you towards the goodness and majesty of who God really is? Are you putting that in there? Are you cultivating the soil of your heart with, with the fellowship of the body of Christ? That's part of it. Are you putting in the service to the Lord? That that is my offering. I am offering my service to you, Lord, and to other believers. Are you you offering that service to God? Are you putting those things in? Or are you putting other things in? When you get hurt, are you putting rage music in? Somebody hurt me, I gotta put some aggressive rage music on. What's that gonna do with you? Somebody hurts me, I'm putting sad music on. Somebody hurts me, I'm putting aggressive music on. Somebody hurts me, I'm putting heartbreak music on. What are you putting in? Are you putting in things that mirror where your heart currently is? Or are you putting things in that point you to where your heart is supposed to go? Is there something wrong with listening to aggressive music? I kind of enjoy it sometimes. Is there something wrong with listening to sad music? Okay, there's a place maybe. Well, you need to understand that what you put into your heart is going to affect you. So do those things make it harder or easier for you to forgive? If you're driving down the road listening to rage music, is that making it harder or easier for you to forgive? No, all you're doing is mirroring where where you currently are. That's what you're doing. When you've had your heart broken and you're listening to that sad music that makes you cry, is that making it harder or easier? It's making it harder. It's making it harder. You're just mirroring where your heart is now instead of where God is taking your heart. What are you putting in? What are you putting in? And then what are you taking out? Putting in, taking out. What are you taking out? Your homework, if you'd be willing to do it, is to go to Ephesians chapter 4. I would say read the whole thing, but, but you could start in 17 and read to 32. 17 to 32. See, 32 is where I got the verse forgiving one another. But guess what? It does not start there. It doesn't start there. It starts with getting rid. Go read it. Getting rid of the weeds. The weeds of what? The weeds of lies, the weeds of theft, the weeds of harsh criticism of others, the weeds of, listen to this, the weeds of bitterness. That's verse 31. When you get to 31, what you're going to notice is is that getting rid of bitterness actually comes separately from the command to forgive in verse 32. That means I can put away my bitterness before I get to forgiveness. Putting it away. Putting away the weeds of wrath, the weeds of anger, the weeds of clamor, the weeds of slander, the weeds of malice. Put that away. Then he says, putting on. What am I putting on? It's not just what I'm putting in, it's what I'm putting on. I'm putting on kindness, compassion, preparing the way. And then finally, the end of verse 32, finally he gets to this, forgive as God in Christ forgave you. That is the groundwork of forgiveness. 
It is the work of cultivating your heart. So can you see now when I say forgiveness is not quick and easy? It's, it's just it's sanctification. It's sanctification. It only happens through continual transformation of your heart. And so that's why I have to start here when we talk about how. I, I can't start with next week. Like, can't you just give me something practical? I hope you see. I am. This is practical. You can't get to next week until you get to this week. I can get up here and I can give you five practical ways to help you forgive. And if I leave this off, if I leave the transforming inner heart work off, it's going to be short. It's not going to be full. It's not going to be complete. And so as we close this day, I want to ask you, if you're a follower of Jesus, commit yourself to the hard work of forgiveness. You, you don't do it alone. Every work you do, you work with the power of him who's in you. He will empower your forgiveness. He will empower your transformation. But cultivate, man, cultivate your heart. Do not think that what you put in does not have an impact on what comes out. It does. The things you're putting in are shaping your heart. So there's things you got to put in and things you got to take out. Cultivate it. Let God transform you into the kind of person who forgives. Are you ready to forgive? Are you ready to forgive? Father, in these moments, as we reflect on what you're trying to do in our hearts, Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to come to terms with this message today, with the truth of what you're trying to do in our lives and what, by your grace, you will accomplish one day. Let us be the kind of people who forgive. Let us not forget to do that groundwork, to cultivate with great care the soil of our hearts. God, if there's one today that's struggling with unforgiveness, oh God, I pray, I pray today that this would take root in their hearts. And God, if there's one that has never put their faith in you, Lord, I pray that you would convict that person today to turn their lives to you, to repent, to believe the good news of what Jesus has accomplished for us. Help us to be responsive people people who know our Lord, people who love our Lord, people who look like our Lord. Let us not be discouraged with the slowness of the process, but instead rejoice in confidence that the work you've started, you will complete. And as you move today, as you convict today, Give us strength to respond in Jesus' name. Amen.